All right, so this conference is on the purification of the Blessed Virgin Mary. Yesterday I spoke about the significance, a little bit of the significance of the purification, and at least I tried to establish the fact that the name of Our Lady under these apparitions, Our Lady of Buen Suceso, is linked to this term, the purification. And the Feast of the Purification is celebrated on February 2nd, as we all know, as we're here preparing for, for that feast day. It's somewhat considered a conclusion to the Christmas time. You'll know that many churches, at least in our circles, they remove their manger scenes, usually at the Feast of the Purification, unless somehow Septuagesima creeps in there. The Purification of a woman after childbirth is one of the prescriptions of the Mosaic Law. It was actually given early on in the book of Leviticus. And that law stated that 40 days after the birth of a boy, it was required that the woman would offer the sacrifice in the temple in order to be cleansed after her childbirth. So actually they break that up into the days leading up to the circumcision of the child and then the days that they would bring the child to the temple. So cleansed of what? It's first of all important to, to have that understanding, just to understand the ceremonial of the purification. A lot of people would say that, well, the Blessed Virgin Mary, she's purity itself. Why would she be so concerned about this prescription of the Mosaic Law on the one hand? On the other hand, we could establish the fact that the birth was miraculous and therefore there wouldn't have been any blood and therefore why would she go through this ceremony? To be cleansed of the blood that is involved with the childbirth. Now, as I said, this doesn't really apply to the Blessed Virgin Mary. Nonetheless, to understand what is the significance of this purification or why did God establish this, it is something very important. So you need to know the background of the idea. And it has everything to do with the development or the kind of settling of the idea of the blood. Blood was something very significant in the Old Testament. It was strictly forbidden to have any contact with blood strictly forbidden, except for one reason. And that's the all important reason. That was the whole reason for forbidding it for everything else. You know that when something is established as sacred, two things are required. The first, that it would be completely removed from anything that is mundane or profane, completely removed, completely set aside. And the other one would be that it was dedicated for some kind of holy purpose, dedicated for a religious or worship purpose. So the one exception to this rule that contact is strictly forbidden with blood was the religious purpose. It was used for the consecration of different things. It was used for the consecration of the people when Moses had sacrificed the, the, the rams, and then they used the blood, and he went down, the, down the, the community of the Israelites that were established, and he was sprinkling the, the Israelites in the blood. And he was saying, this is the testament of, in, in the blood. This is the testament in blood. The covenant agreed on between God and man. It was sealed with blood. The blood was also used to consecrate the priests. I'm not really sure about the significance of the right earlobe and the right thumb and the right big toe, but nonetheless, blood was put on those things as part of the consecration of the priest. It was also used in the sacrifices, and that has a particular connection with the purification because on that occasion, a sacrifice was offered. So it was used to adore and worship God. It showed the giving of our own life. Why was it that blood was chosen by God? There's one of those famous expressions that the life 
is in the blood. And if you're trying to make this act of worship towards God where you're saying, my life is in your hands, you're going to try to use those things that either signify life, the blood, or things that are used to uphold our life, food. So you sacrifice a lamb, normally you'd eat that. And normally that would sustain your life. So when you sacrifice a lamb, the significance is, once again, my life is in your hands. Or when you sacrifice the, the, the grains of wheat, once again, it goes to support life. There was a reason why those objects were chosen. They were not some random things. It was a reason why Cain and Abel chose the things that they offered. So in a sacrifice, there is firstly the offering of something, and that thing represents one's, oneself. I want this to stand in my behalf. I want that to be counted for me. This is me. And then it was, it was destroyed. And that destruction meant to show that ultimate act of humility. Like, I am really dependent upon thee completely. I am in your hands. My life is this fragile before you. So there was a lot of logic that went into the idea of sacrifice. And believe it or not, sacrifice really springs from our nature. Because men, as human beings, composed of body and soul, they will always have their aspirations of soul, but they will look for ways to express it exteriorly. And so in every sacrifice, there's an exterior element, and then there's also the interior element. Well, the sacrifices of the old law, for example. So blood was used for that to adore and worship God, but also to forgive sins. Any other use of the blood in the Old Testament was contaminating. For example, Moses actually prescribed specific things. When you go out hunting and you kill an animal, make sure you bleed it out right there in the field. You dig a little hole, you pour the blood in the hole, and you kick dirt over it, like a cat would do in the litter box. It was forbidden to eat the blood. If you did, you were alienated and cut off from your people. The punishments that came from contact with blood were very severe. You could tell that God in the Old Testament was really trying to make a point. If you eat blood, you're out. Go out into the wilderness, into the exterior darkness, where with the weeping of dogs and the gnashing of teeth, or however you want to say it. It will all, you're out. Expelled from the communica community, excommunication very severe penalties. It was forbidden to touch a dead body, one that died with the blood in it. That's why Tobias in the Old Testament was considered legally impure for burying the dead, those that were killed by the, I don't remember who it was now, the, the non-Israelites that were occupying. <laughs> It was forbidden to be with your wife during that time of the month. And that's why the woman who had the issue of blood in the, old, in the, the gospel reading, she had that issue of blood for 12 years. She was considered legally impure, living in a state being cut off from her people because of that legal impurity. So after 40 days, the issue of blood involved with childbirth would certainly be finished with the sacrifice that was offered upon her going to the temple. You'd either offer a lamb, and if you were dirt poor, you would offer two turtle doves. One of them was a burnt offering, the other one was a sin offering. And so when they were offered, the sacrifice was made by the priest. They would come to the temple, they would purchase those two turtle doves, they would bring them to the priest, and they would be sacrificed. And with that sacrifice, one of the authors even said that the blood of the, of the one 
turtle dove, the one for the sin offering, was actually sprinkled on the woman to signify that she is now legally pure. So Joseph and Mary, they go to the temple to make this sacrifice. As I said, Mary did not have any issue of blood. The birth was miraculous, keeping her perpetual virginity. But the law still prescribed, and they, they obeyed the law. But something more happens at this visit to the temple. Joseph and particularly Mary, they make an offering. They know the Mosaic law, the offering of the, the sacrifice. All of those sacrifices in the Old Testament, they signify and prefigure the sacrifice of Christ. So when Joseph and Mary bring the, boy, the baby Jesus into the temple, and then that sacrifice is offered, and they see those victims actually killed, the turtle doves are killed, and the blood is taken out, it is an image of what will happen to her son. And at that moment, as I just said a moment ago, there's an exterior of every sacrifice. Well, the sacrifice of Christ on the cross, that will come 30-something years later. But the interior of the sacrifice is present at this moment. And that is that interior disposition of soul in which Mary will offer her son. Offer her son to the death of the cross, signified in the ritual that just took place. So Mary offers her son. She's aware of the prophecies of the suffering Messiah, and she offers him at this moment to that sacrificial sin offering of the cross. As I said, there was the burnt offering, which was the total consumption of the victim, and then the sin offering, in which the blood was taken out, and it was, some of it was sprinkled on the woman, but some of it was also put on the altar. The altar also, as we know in the New Testament, is a figure of the cross, a figure of Christ himself, but also the cross where the sacrifice takes place. And so Mary, in a very aware fashion, we do not pretend that the Blessed Virgin Mary was unaware of, of the destiny of her son. She knew that her son would be suffering a death for the redemption of her people. This offering that she makes, as I've said in other talks, it's the greatest sacrifice that enters the temple. We can think about the temple being built for what purpose? The temple was built for the Holy of Holies, which held the Ark of the Covenant. In the Ark of the Covenant, you had some manna, that was used to feed the Israelites. And you had the, the rod of Aaron, which was used for many of the different miracles. For example, the parting of the sea and things like that. Then outside the Holy of Holies, you had the holies. And that was where the, the daily sacrifices were, were performed. That was where the altar of sacrifice was. I think, don't quote me. I could be wrong on that one. Surely the, the, the candle of the, the, the different, the candlestick was in the, um, in the holies. The altar of incense, sorry, it's the altar of incense that was in the holies, and the altar of holocaust was out front of that because the people could see that, whereas the, the administering of the, of the duty of the priest was to, to offer the incense in the holies. So when, for example, you know the story of the father of John the Baptist, St. Zachary, he went into the city of Jerusalem to perform his priestly duty. He was there for an entire week. And during that week, actually he was there a week before for preparation and legal purifications. And then when his turn came, he stayed in that function for an entire week, going into the temple, into the holies, to offer the incense on the, on the altar of incense. So that was his his job for the week. The altar of Holocaust was out front. So it's the greatest sacrifice. The building itself 
was made for these sacrifices to take place. Sacrifices under the, the, the law of Moses were not allowed anywhere else. And that was also, we could say, a movement on the part of God. You remember in the time of the patriarchs, the patriarchs offered sacrifices. You know, Abraham, go into the land of vision and offer a sacrifice that I will appoint to you. Take Isaac with you, by the way. So then he marches off and God says, don't worry, I'll tell you when to get there. And then eventually he says, okay, go up that mountain there. And then he gets up there and God tells Abraham to sacrifice his son there. The angel stops Abraham, and instead God provides another sacrifice, a ram whose horns had been entangled in the bushes and couldn't escape. And so they offered that. They built a little altar there, and they offered that as a sacrifice. Or when Noah popped the hatch on the ark, said, finally, some fresh air, the first thing they did was build an altar and offer a sacrifice. Or Cain and Abel, they offered sacrifices. All the patriarchs offered sacrifices. But when the law of Moses came, that came to a dead stop. There will be only one place of sacrifice. And that would be before the temple was built, it would be in the tabernacle. And after the temple was built, it would be in, within the temple. That's the only place. All of the synagogues that existed throughout the land of Israel, they did not offer sacrifices. One sacrifice. What was in the mind of God? It was to prepare them for the idea of one sacrifice. So this is the greatest sacrifice to enter the temple. As such, we could say that the temple was even built for this purpose. The temple was built laying in wait for one day. One day. A day in which Mary would bring her son and offer him in spirit to the death of the cross. It has everything. This feast day of the purification commemorates the whole idea of sacrifice. As such, Mary is fulfilling a quasi-priestly role. What do you mean, Father? She ain't no priest. She's fulfilling a quasi-priestly role. Okay, let's think about that term for a minute. The priesthood. We know that there have been historically several priesthoods. All of them different. The Levitical priesthood, much more organized. You have to do it this way, this many times. If you miss a beat, I could strike you dead. In fact, on the Day of Atonement, it was well known that the high priest would tie a rope around his ankle because if perchance he was struck dead, at least they could drag the body out because they surely weren't going in. So the prescriptions of the Mosaic or the Levitical priesthood, they didn't exist for Abraham. It wasn't as if God was saying, now Abraham, make sure you sing, swing that thurible three doubles. That wasn't happening. So there was a difference in their priesthood. We also know from St. Paul in his epistle to the Hebrews, there was a difference in the priesthood of Aaron, the Levitical priesthood. He was of the tribe of Levi. And the priesthood of Melchizedek. And St. Paul will say that the superior priesthood was that of Melchizedek, and that is signified in the fact that, that Abraham paid tithes. Abraham, who's in his loins, so to speak, are all the 12 sons, including Levi and therefore including Aaron. And they paid tithes to Melchizedek, signifying that Melchizedek is greater than the Levitical priesthood. But priesthood is an analogous term. That means the term can be applied to many different persons or groups of persons, and they may all have something in common, and they will all have something different. And we can compare them by the similarities that they have, and we can compare them by the one that is 
the highest and the, it's called the, in, in, in analogy, when making an analogy in philosophy, we say there's one that's the prime analogate. It means it's the one that carries the very definition of all the others. And all the others, they can claim the term by the relationship that it has with the prime analogate. So in this sense, we would say that the priesthood of our Lord Jesus Christ, that is the prime analogate. And all of the others, we call them priesthood because of some similarity that they have with Christ's. Understanding that, when we say Mary is fulfilling a quasi-priestly role, we can look at what are the similarities that she has to Christ's priesthood. So we can make a list, if you will, first of all, of the different priesthoods. Have the priesthood of Adam, not me, the priesthood of Adam in the state of original justice, definitely not me. The first man, Adam, in the state of original justice, what is his similarity with Christ's priesthood? And it lays in the perfection of his act of worship. Because Adam, in the state of original justice, he knows no sin, and when he offers any act of worship to God, it has a perfection. It has a perfection that is not seen in any man until the Virgin Mary shows up. Because we remember the Virgin Mary also is the Immaculate Conception. So the priesthood of Abel and the patriarchs, something significant about those, we would look at the, the dispositions within their soul when they make these acts of adoration. A lot of times when people focus on the a lot of times when people focus on the priesthood of Christ, we tend to really stress the idea that it is his blood, it is the, the act of him hanging on the cross, the physical elements that are involved with his sacrificial death. And we tend to not really ignore, but undervalue the internal dispositions of his soul in offering himself. And those interior dispositions, that is the similarity that the patriarchs, the holy patriarchs, have with the priesthood of Christ. It's not a question of what they offered. Who cares what they offered? It's really not important. What's important is that interior disposition of soul, which is one of worship, it's one of reverence, it's one of adoration, it's one of obedience, it's one of submission, it's one of humility. Those are the interior dispositions of Christ in his humanity on the cross. And that's why we say the patriarchs have a kind of priesthood. We can say the same of Abraham, even though Abraham is called in a very special way. And we can look at the particular sacrifice of his son Isaac, take your only begotten son, make him carry the wood of the sacrifice up the mountain, and there you will sacrifice him. A particular kind of connection with Christ, who is the only begotten of the Father, who will carry the wood of the cross on which he will be sacrificed. Then we have the priesthood of Aaron, Aaron was the brother of Moses, of the tribe of Levi, so that it's called the Levitical priesthood. God ordered and specified all the details of that priesthood. So much so that if the priest stepped out of line and did the wrong thing, like two of the sons of Aaron, Aaron had four sons. Well, after the first two did something wrong by offering strange incense, because God even defined the formula of incense, you will use this much of this ingredient, this much of this ingredient, and by the way, don't you dare use these ingredients for anything else. And then put this together in this fashion, and then you will burn it on charcoal in a thurible, thus offering incense. 
Well, two of his sons thought, you know, oh, we prefer rose extract or whatever it was. And God struck them dead on the spot for innovating. Oh, that's a great word. <laughs> innovating. God struck them dead for innovating or being original, we'll say. We can next put the priesthood of the Blessed Virgin Mary at this moment. Like I said, we use the term by way of analogy. The priesthood of Mary, what are we focusing on here? Firstly, we focus on her sinless state. And so when she offers something to God, it is going to be more perfect because of that sinless state. And then the priesthood of Christ. I'll get on to the, I just want to list at this moment the priesthood of, of the Blessed Virgin Mary. Then the priesthood of Christ, as I said, it's the first by which all of the other priesthood gain any, any merit. So the priesthood of Mary, why is it so noble? Because it's the closest to the prime analogate. It's the closest to our Lord Jesus Christ. Why is it the closest? Well, Christ is sinless, says St. Paul. He became like all men. He became like men in all these things except sin. He knew no sin. For the Blessed Virgin Mary, she is the Immaculate Conception. She is sinless, and therefore when she makes an act of offering or an act of adoration, it's more perfect than one who is in sin. We can say that the The reason why the priesthood of Mary is also more perfect is because of the victim that she offers. And that's particularly important on this day of the purification as she enters into the temple. The real sacrifice that she's offering is not two turtle doves. The real sacrifice that she's offering is her divine son and not in a vague way but she knows exactly the death that he will be offering of himself. And she unites herself to that immolation. So we spoke about the interior and the exterior element. We do not consider that Mary has this exalted priesthood simply because it's Christ that she's offering, but even more so because of the interior dispositions of her soul matching perfectly those of her son. That interior disposition. And therefore, her role as co-redemptrix, we can say Mary has always been the co-redemptrix. It's probably attached to her title as mother of God and mother of Christ, one and the same. But her role as co-redemptrix takes a significant advance at this first moment of her offering her son. She is sinless. She is the mother. She is full of grace. Her conversation with God is the closest to Christ's. How she offers within her spirit is closest to Christ's, and what she offered is identified with Christ, namely Christ himself. She is queen of patriarchs, also because of this. We think about that priesthood of the patriarchs and their connection with the priesthood of Christ. She is queen of the patriarchs because she exalts. She is the, she's the epitome of this spirit of interior sacrifice. She's the highest. Christ does not give his life at, the, at this moment in the temple. And therefore, this giving of, of his life in the temple, let me rephrase that because it didn't sound right. Christ does not offer himself unto death at this moment, but nevertheless, he is offered. And that's what the temple was built for, for that offering. 
Now we know that Christ actually dies outside the walls. If Christ had died crucified within the temple or within the holies or holy of holies, then we would say, yes, indeed, that was the greatest sacrifice to have entered the building. We could say that's what the, the temple was for. But in the divine providence, it was prophesied that Christ would die outside the walls. And therefore, the greatest sacrifice to enter in those walls is the one that Mary performs on this day of purification. And she does not just offer her son, as I said, she offers herself with him. And even if it was just herself, it would still be the greatest sacrifice that entered into the walls. The priesthood has also other things that we could have put on the list, which is still the priesthood of Christ, all of those that are the ordained ministers of Christ, they possess Christ's priesthood. And we could also point to what St. Peter calls as the royal priesthood. He tells that to his faithful, you are a royal priesthood. By analogy, what does that mean? It means now that you have been cleansed by the blood of Christ and your consciences are clean, as St. Paul would say in his epistle to the Hebrews, because you have received that, now you can worship God. Because you have been baptized, unless a man be born again of water and the Holy Ghost, he cannot enter into life. Because you've been baptized, you possess that royal priesthood. Yesterday I mentioned that there's an office which is given with each of the sacraments that confirm a give a character and the ones that use oil, the chrism, to consecrate. Baptism was the first. What is the office that you are given? You are now capable of adoring God. And without baptism, you are incapable of adoring God in a supernaturally meritorious way, which is really the only thing that counts. You don't get through the doors of heaven on natural religion, period. It's only supernatural religion. And that's only possible through baptism. And with your baptism, you possess that office now of adoring God. <clears throat> and even more than that, because of the grace of God within our soul, the presence of Christ, we are greater than any patriarch or priest of the Old Testament. But we are not greater than Mary, who possessed Christ in her soul so much more than us, and even before she possessed Christ in her body. And so she's the queen and the mother of priests, a well-known theme that is returned to particularly in retreats that are given to priests. So the purification of Mary is not about being purified from some issue of blood, nor is it about some obedience to the Mosaic prescriptions, but it is about sacrifice and offering, and particularly the offering of herself with her divine son. Why is that important today? And why is that important for religious? Making connection to what was said yesterday. Well, this crisis of the faith that we are enduring could be characterized by a loss of the sense of sacrifice. Certainly the enemy had something great in mind when he attacked the sacrifice because he knew that if he attacked the sacrifice, then you're going to also attack the priesthood attached with it. And we see, obviously, within the church these past decades a real tragedy and a large a gigantic misunderstanding about the identity of the priest. Because the priest 
has a difficult time identifying himself with the evisceration of sacrifice. And in the life of the religious, what is their supreme act? It's the offering of self. That's what the life of a religious is all about. The offering and the sacrifice of oneself. And it's not rocket science to look at what's happened in the church where the religious vocations have it's been crushed, destroyed. Even speaking with one of the Franciscans of this city, mentioning, he was mentioning to me, and he used the word crisis. He said, after the council, when the reforms came in, a real crisis hit us within the Franciscans. And in my class, we were 33. And then after a year, or less than a year, all of them gone. Only two remained. A real crisis in the religious vocation, because if you take away this idea of sacrifice, you take away their life. They have no life. They have no meaning. What would you become a religious for? So why would the Blessed Virgin Mary say that this particular title, Maria del Buen Suceso de la Purificación, understanding that the purification has everything to do with sacrifice, now we can start to link Maria del Buen Suceso de la Purificación together with the crisis of the church and the remedy of the crisis. And that's why she would say exactly that. So, once again, I urge you, when you refer to Our Lady under this title, Maria of Buen Suceso, of the purification, don't forget that part. Because if you do, you're forgetting everything. And if you have any reason of turning to her, Mary of good success, and you forget that part, you don't really know why you're turning to her. Other than it's the Blessed Virgin Mary and we pray to her. You don't know the reason. Okay, so this particular conference is going to be on the the value of monastic life. I know this sounds a little bit strange to be giving this type of a conference to you because none of you are nuns and none of you are monks. But in order to understand what is the value of the convent of the Immaculate Conception, which we have Mass in every morning, accompanied together with the